This meeting is being recorded. I'm trying this on Zoom this time, so we're going to see if this works any better than the PowerPoint audio. So I hope you'll let me know in the discussion board whether you prefer the Zoom file or whether you prefer the PowerPoint audio. Uh, this is chapter two, Observing the Sky, the Birth of Astronomy. When we look at the night sky, as you can see on this slide here, we can see some different things depending upon where we are on the planet. As I mentioned in our first lecture, a scene like this will be very obviously from the southern hemisphere. And why is that? Because if you look over to the left, you'll see two sort of fuzzy patches there. One is the Large Magellanic Cloud and the other is the Small Magellanic Cloud. And they can only really be seen from the Southern Hemisphere. We can also see the Milky Way skirting across the, the horizon here. Again, as I mentioned last time, depending upon where you are on the planet and what time of day you're looking at it, you'll see it at different angles. Because as we go around the Sun and as we revolve on our sphere, the orientation of things in the sky change quite dramatically. Wherever you are, there you are. And wherever you are, directly overhead is your zenith. So think about looking straight up, that is your zenith. That is actually 90 degrees from the horizon. If you were to take the zenith here and go all the way to the horizon and then straight across, that's a right angle. That's 90 degrees. It's also 90 degrees in the other direction. It's also 90 degrees back and 90 degrees forward. It's actually 90 degrees all the way around. So the horizon is at zero. The zenith is at 90. When you go back down the other way, that starts going back down to zero. So the sky overhead is entirely 180 degrees. This is the ground preventing you from seeing the other 180 degrees, which would be underneath. But wherever you are, you have a zenith that's directly overhead, and you have a horizon, which is 90 degrees from the zenith, wherever you are. You can be at different places on the planet, and where you are on the planet, as I've mentioned before, will determine what you can see in the sky. If you were where our little figurine is here, which is somewhere in North America, you will be able to see all the things in this area you will not be able to see things in the southern area that's being blocked by the planet Earth because you can't see through the planet. You would be able to see the North Star. You would be able to see various things in this path here. This path is called the ecliptic, and we'll talk more about that later. You would not be able to see the South Pole. There is no South Polar Star. There is a North Star. But think about the North and South Pole on our planet and think about those being imaginary lines that extend if you sort of think about a globe having an axis where the globe spins around. Think about those extending out into space. Those also become the North Celestial Pole and the South Celestial Pole. And from our perspective here on Earth, it would seem like the whole sky is going around us. That's why for the longest time in, a, in a human history, people thought the universe revolved around us. How many of you know someone who thinks the whole universe goes around them? I'll bet you do. But if you were to take a time-lapse photo of one of these polar regions, you would see something like this. And here's something to think about. What else in your room or somewhere in your home is circular that tells time? The answer is most of us have a clock. So we could tell how long this time-lapse time photo was exposed by looking at the lengths of the arcs in the sky. Because if we think about it, it can't be 24 hours for two reasons. One, 24 hours would give us a complete circle. Also, what happens to the stars during the day? They disappear because it's too bright outside, so they would be gone. So it has to be less than 24 hours. Well, here's a really easy way to figure out how long this would be. Think about having clock arms going out, and here's a really bright arc here. This is probably about 2.30 to 2.45, and this is maybe about 4.30 or so. So this is a little under two hours. Now, if we look over here at this bright arc here, this looks like it's at 9 o'clock, and this looks like it might be 10.30 to 11. So again, it's a little under two hours. 
each of these arcs, this one here looks like it's about maybe a little before one o'clock. This looks like it's a little after 2.30. This is a little under two hours. Each of these arcs, whether they're large ones or small ones, smaller ones in here, all take about two hours or so to go around. So we can tell how long this has been exposed. When we're looking at things in the sky, everything rises in the east, everything sets in the west. You'll notice that the sun comes up, the moon comes up, the planets come up, the stars come up. They all come up in the east and they arc through the sky and then they set in the west. Sometimes they set a little bit more to the south, sometimes a little bit more to the north, depending upon our seasons, but it's always setting in a westerly direction. It's always rising in an easterly direction. That happens with the stars as well, and we happen to have uh, the, the constellation Orion, which you'll see here with Betelgeuse and Rigel, which I've mentioned before. We have the three stars in the belt of Orion, and then Betelgeuse is a reddish star, Rigel is a bluish star. We can watch it come up and go down over the course of the night, always rising in the east and setting in the west. We always call local noon the time when the sun is highest in the sky. It will, here in Indiana, never be at our zenith. It never gets that high in the sky. But whenever it's highest in the sky, that's noon. That's the, the midpoint of the actual day. Sometimes it doesn't correspond to 12 o'clock on our clocks because we live in time zones, so we're taking estimates of where it would be. But if you think about the sky, think about it in terms of a celestial sphere. We have a North Pole and a South Pole on our planet, a North Pole and a South Pole celestially, and we have everything that goes around those poles. Polaris, pole, Eris, pole, Eris is a, a, a word meaning star, nor star, a polar star. There is no South Polar star. Now, don't make the mistake of thinking that the North Pole or Polaris is your zenith. It's only your zenith if you're standing at the North Pole. Your zenith moves around with you. So wherever you are, the zenith is directly overhead at 90 degrees. We can sort of see that here. If you are standing here in the first uh, uh, graphic for A, at the North Pole, your zenith would be the North Celestial Pole. Polaris would be right overhead. But over here at image B, if you were to look at your zenith there, you're sort of standing on the equator. So now the pole star is going to be near your horizon because you're looking down towards it. Where we are, it's sort of halfway in between, roughly 40 degrees up. If you were to go from zero to 90, we're about 40 degrees up here. So the pole star is also 40 degrees. If you can sort of figure out how far up the pole star is, that tells you what your latitude is. Latitude is how far north and south you are on the planet. Longitude is east and west. We'll go over that again in a moment. As we go around the sun, there are parts of the sky that will be visible to us at night and parts that will not be visible because the sun's in the way. So as the stars go around us, we're actually not having the stars go around us. It's because we are going around the sun and it makes it appear that the stars seem to be moving around us. Now that confused people for a very long time. So if that confuses you, don't be too hard on yourself because lots of smart people throughout history have wondered about this. But as we go around the sun, you'll notice here on this earth, on this side, that's daytime. So anything that would be in the sky on the other side of the sun, we wouldn't see because the sun is in the way, it's too bright. Over here on this side of the planet, however, is nighttime. So we would be able to see these stars. So let's say you're a Taurus. Okay, Taurus is in May and June. Here's where the Earth is in June. Guess what? You can't see the constellation Taurus in the sky during your birthday month. Why? because it's over here on the other side of the sun. I'm a Libra, so when I'm a Libra, this, the Earth is going to be actually over here in this direction, because Libra is going to be on the other side of the sun. 
That's why they call those sun signs. I'll talk a little bit about astrology later. Astrology is not a science. Astronomy is a science. Astrology is a religion about the stars. And there is a difference, but we'll talk about that later. But both of them share an interest in these particular constellations because of our tilt. Remember our tilt? We're tilted towards Polaris. We're tilted at 23 and a half degrees, and that's relative to the sun's pole, which is straight up and down. And that means as we go around, the sun, as it goes through the sky, intersects with these particular constellations. And that makes them easily recognizable and significant. Now you may notice that you recognize some of these names, Aries and Taurus and Gemini and Leo and all of the others as zodiac signs, constellation signs. But what about this one over here, Ophiuchus? Calendars are interesting things. Not everyone shares the same calendar. It's 2020 according to the calendar we're using here in the modern world in terms of business and in terms of the Western world, but it's actually a different year in the Jewish calendar and a different year in the Muslim calendar and a different year in the Chinese calendar and a different year in a lot of different calendars throughout history. And not everyone's had 12 months and not everyone's had 24 or, or, or 30 days in a month. Sometimes we don't even have a standardized month and we've not always had 12 zodiac constellations. Ophiuchus here is the forgotten one that's there. These are the typical zodiac signs, and one of the things you'll notice is that they correspond to patterns that people thought they saw in the sky. And we keep these mostly from the Greco-Roman tradition, although we are beginning to start naming things in the sky after things other than Greece and Rome. Now, these are the ones that go around the sun as the sun it intersects with them in the sky. So we call them ecliptic or zodiac constellations. However, there are some that are up here above or down here below. They will seem to go around the pole, and we call those circumpolar constellations. They don't intersect with this line here. This line here, the ecliptic, is special because not only does the sun go through that line, but the moon and all the planets seem to go through that line as well. So you'll hear of, of the planets and the moons and the sun going through Leo or Cancer or Virgo. They will never go through the Big Dipper, for example. They'll never go through the Little Dipper. They'll never go through the Southern Cross. They'll never go through constellations that aren't on this line. But if something is up above or below, it seems to circle the pole, and we call those circumpolar constellations. And you will see those every night of the year. You won't see Pisces every night of the year. You won't see Libra every night of the year. But here in Indiana, you will always see the Big Dipper. You will always see the Little Dipper. And that's because as we go around, sometimes we're tilted towards the sun, sometimes we're tilted away from the sun, but that's because as we go around, we're always tilted towards Polaris. So sometimes the sun is a little higher in the sky. Sometimes it's a little lower in the sky. And right now we're tilted from that spin of the sun, from that pole, which gives us the plane that we're going around the sun in at 23 and a half degrees. That's a good number to remember. And you can sort of see that angle right here. As we are going around the sun, however, we're not always tilted up towards Polaris. We are very slowly wobbling. It takes about 26,000 years for us to complete the wobble so that we will sometimes be pointed at other pole stars. Now, I used to run a lab where we would look at different pole stars over the course of time. In 13,000 years, we'll actually be pointed in a different direction. We'll be pointed at Vega. And when that happens, it will be summer in December here in Indiana, and it will be winter in June and July in Indiana. Things will shift. Now, it won't just shift automatically all at once. It will slowly change over time. Now, Thuban was our pole star about 5,000 years ago, and there are others in between that we'll encounter over the course of 26,000 years before we come back to Polaris. This has implications for what happens on our planet. 
because as we wobble and as our continents shift around due to tectonic forces, we'll talk about that as well, it can change our climate. So if you've ever met anyone who says, I don't believe in climate change, well, guess what? The climate has been changing on our planet since our planet formed, and it continues to change whether we do anything about it or not. The key question is actually, are we as human beings making the climate change worse or better? That's a legitimate question, and we'll talk about that later. But absolutely no one on the planet should doubt that there is climate change, because we've had climate change all along. In fact, we live in an area here in Bloomington that is right on the edge of one of the major climate changes that we've had in the past 10,000 years, and that was in the Ice Age. If any of you live in Martinsville, you may know that there's a difference in the water there, and I'm not just talking about the issues recently with the chemicals in the water. Your team name for the high school there is the Artesians. That refers to the water that's there. That's because in the last Ice Age, climate change, the glaciers stopped right around Martinsville. And as they receded, as they melted away, water fell into the water table and changed things there a little bit. Now we still have those glaciers. They're called Great Lakes. That's why the Great Lakes are freshwater and not seawater. They're melted glaciers. And the reason why the terrain in northern Indiana is different from southern Indiana, you drive north to Chicago and things get really flat. You go south to Louisville or Evansville and you get lots of rolling hills and other kinds of things. That's because the glaciers receded there. That's climate change. Our climate is always changing. And part of the reason is precession because 10,000 years ago, we were pointed more towards Vega over here than towards Polaris. Now, as we look up in the sky, it's easy to map things out if we have a pattern to look for. This is the constellation Orion. I've mentioned it before. You can see the picture here with somewhat exaggerated colors. The three stars of the belt are easy to recognize. This reddish star up at the top is Betelgeuse. Remember that. It's the most likely star to explode in your lifetime. Then we have Rigel down here. It's also a bright blue star. You can often see the colors in these two stars. Most stars just appear as white lights, but these will often give you a little bit of a shading along the way. So we have Betelgeuse here. We have Rigel here. We have our other three stars that are in the belt. And then we have this little sword hanging down. This is where those nebulae that I've been showing you before are. These are where gas and dust are forming new stars along the way. As we look at the sky, we see there are lots of different patterns. Canis major, that means big dog. Canis minor, that's the small dog. This star here, Sirius, is called the dog star in Canis major. That's the brightest star in the sky, except for the sun, of course. There are a couple of things that are brighter. The moon is brighter. Venus and Jupiter, when they're in season, are also brighter. But it's the brightest star. It's eight light years away. That means if they're watching right now the election cycle on television in, in uh, Sirius, they're wondering if Barack Obama is going to get a second term because it takes eight years for our television signals to reach them. They have no idea what's coming. Some of the constellations look more or less like they might as Scorpius. This kind of looks like a scorpion. Sagittarius This kind of looks like a kind of a goat or a ram with a horn or something like that. Some of them, not so much. That doesn't really look like a dog to me, and that doesn't look like a dog to me. But there are 88 constellations all over the sky. It's sort of like a map with county divisions. So these are county divisions as well as street maps so that you can find your way through the stars. Depending upon where you are on the planet, as I've mentioned before, sometimes you'll be able to see things differently. If you're up here on this top grid here, Quito is at Ecuador. Ecuador is a country at the equator. So Ecuador, equal, equal, Ecuador. So that is right overhead. The sun is at the zenith there. So it's going to be really high in the sky. But the further up the planet you go, notice the further down the sun goes at the same time. And if you were up here at the North Pole, it might be somewhere down near the horizon. When I visited Iceland, the sun is always low in the sky. When I visit 
Hawaii, or if I visit the Panama Canal, which I've done before, the sun is very high in the sky along the way. What you see depends upon where you are. And as we go around, remember we're tilted here, and sometimes we're tilted. Notice the northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. This is summer in the northern hemisphere. Then we go to the other side, six months later, we're tilted away from the sun. It's winter here, but guess what? It's summer down in Australia. See, it's tilted towards the sun down there. It's winter in Australia when it's summer in Indiana. It's summer in Australia when it's winter in Indiana. These are called the solstice days. These are the longest and shortest days of the year. When it's the longest day of the year in Indiana, it's the shortest day of the year down south. When it's the shortest day of the year in Indiana, it's the longest day down there. Halfway between those, notice as it's going around here, we get spring and fall. Those are also opposite in the southern hemisphere. That's all because of tilt. That's all because of tilt. You'll have some questions on quizzes. Why do we have seasons? It's all because of tilt. Some planets don't tilt. They don't have seasons. Some planets do tilt. They have seasons. But see here, if you're way up at the North Pole, the sun is lower in the sky. If you are closer to where we are, the sun is higher in the sky. But also notice in the winter and the summer where the sun is changes. It's not just in the sky for a shorter period of time. It's also in the sky for a lower angle. And that lower angle is part of what makes it colder. Not just the fact that it's not in the sky a long time, but because we call this the angle of incidence. Notice this is much sharper. This is almost 90 degrees. At the equator, it is 90 degrees. Guess what? It's hot there all the time. At the North Pole and South Pole, it's always at a shallow angle. So guess what? It's cold there all the time. We're halfway in between. One of the ways in which we've always known that the world is a sphere, that the world is round and not flat, is because we can see the shadow on the moon as the moon goes behind us and gets a shadow cast on it from the Earth as we're blocking the sunlight. And you can see here in this lunar eclipse photo that we have some evidence. There are several ways in which we can verify this. We don't have to launch a rocket up to see it. But if light is coming from the sun, if the sun were closer, the rays would be bent more. But since it, the sun is very, very far away, you'll notice they all seem to be pretty straight. The more distant it is, the more parallel the rays will be. And the sun, as you remember, is 93 million miles away. So according to this, I'd have to push the cursor over probably about half a mile for it to be to scale. We have done calendars based on the sun as we go around, or the moon as it goes around us. Now, a lot of early calendars based on the sun didn't realize we were going around the sun. They thought the sun was also going around us. But they did notice that it goes up and down in the sky. The moon seems to follow that because the moon and the sun are both following the ecliptic. But as the moon goes around, it goes around about once a month. I deliberately mispronounced that, month, month. That's where that word comes from. Now, the moon goes around, and as it goes around, we get different phases. When it's on the same side as the sun, we don't see the moon. It's a new moon, because the sunlit side is on the other side that we're seeing. See here, we're only seeing the dark side. But the moon, as it goes around, we see a bit more and a bit more and a bit more until it's full, and thus we see the full moon. The dark side is facing away from us and then it goes back to the new. As the moon is growing in our sky towards full, we call it waxing. As it's receding back towards new, we call it waning. And we have crescents and quarters, gibbous and full. And notice that waxing and waning crescent, quarter and quarter, we can say first or third or first and last, and then waxing and waning gibbous, new and full. Moons that go around us, are different depending on how we define it. The moon just going around us without taking into account the phases takes about 27 days. 
But as it's going around us, we are still going around the sun. And as we're going around the sun, it takes a couple of more days for the moon to catch up to where it was with the sun. So the cycle of phases takes closer to 30 days. And that's part of why some months have 30 days, some have 31. One month has 28 days, unless like this year it had 29 days because the moon doesn't go around in a precise sequence of days. Now we sometimes have lunar eclipses when the moon is behind the earth. Notice the earth is much larger than the moon, so it has a larger shadow. The main shadow is called the umbra. That simply means dark in Latin, penumbra, almost dark. So we go through the two different shadows. If it goes through the complete umbra, we call it a full eclipse. If it only hits part of it, we call it a partial eclipse. The same happens with a solar eclipse. And you may have, in 2017, gone somewhere nearby to see the total eclipse of the sun. Notice the moon is much smaller. So the moon being smaller has a smaller shadow. And that umbra, that area of total eclipse, is very, very small. It's only a couple of dozen miles across at most as it's going over our planet. But the penumbra is rather larger. However, if you're up here or down here, you're not going to see anything at all. Now, this doesn't happen every month because as the moon goes around the Earth, it wobbles a little too. It doesn't go around in a perfect circle, and sometimes it's larger. We call that the perigee. That's also a supermoon. When it's at its furthest point from us, it's an apogee. We sometimes call that a mini moon. So that hasn't caught on as much as supermoon has. But if we were to have a total solar eclipse during the apogee or mini moon phase, because the moon is further away and looks smaller, it won't cover the entire sun. So we call that an annular eclipse. Annular is from the Latin word annulus, which means ring. I mentioned the moon wobbles. This is exactly how it happens. As the moon goes around, it's sometimes up and sometimes down, so the shadows miss. There are eclipse seasons. They happen twice a year. Only when things line up properly will we get a full moon and a new moon during the nodes, see this we call the line of nodes, that give us our eclipses. And we'll always have a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse within two weeks of each other because they'll both line up at the nodes. And then we'll be without eclipses of either sort for several months until we get back to the nodes again. Now, if you look up at the sky, you can do some handy dandy tricks here. Now here's something you can do. Just stick your hand right out and then hold up a finger. And that finger is probably about half a degree. Remember I talked about our horizon being at zero and our zenith being at 90? that is going to be 180 fingers. You can start and just sort of start level, sort of straight out from you, and then put one finger on top of the other. It'll take you about 180 steps to get all the way up. But you can do it much faster by holding out your fist. Hold out your fist, just straight out in front of you, and then put your next fist on top, and then take the first one off and put it on top, and it'll take you about nine steps to get directly overhead. So your fist is about 10 degrees up. Your finger is about half a degree. That'll actually cover the moon. That'll cover the sun. Try it when we have clear skies sometime. Go out to the moon and just close one eye and hold up your thumb or hold up your finger and you'll see it pretty much covers the moon. The reason why these are helpful is because usually close is good in astronomy. I will say that quite a number of times in our class. And one of the things you can do to find Polaris the North Star, is go out at night, face north, and then use your fists. Start out with one straight in front of you, and then put the next one, and the next one, and the next one. It's going to be about four fists up from the horizon, and then you'll see where Polaris is. So we can do these things as a sort of handy cheat. Now, as I mentioned, Sometimes the sun is higher in the sky, sometimes it's lower in the sky. It's higher in the sky in the summer, it's lower in the sky in the winter. We notice this in different ways, in part because some things give off shadows and some, some things come through windows at different times. At my house, I used to have a window that two times a year 
for uh, several days. You couldn't sit in a chair in the morning because the sun coming up just beamed right into that chair. No other time of year though. That's because the sun going from the winter to the summer was going up and from the summer back to the winter was going down. If you could do a time-lapse photograph of the sun, say once every two weeks or so, you could trace out this pattern where it goes from the lower to the higher and back again. We call this pattern the analema. Notice it looks like a figure eight or an infinity sign. Notice it's a little bit lopsided. In part, that's because we don't go around in a perfect circle either. We are sometimes a little bit closer to the sun and sometimes a little bit further away. But no matter where we are on the planet, on June 21st, the sun is going to be either longest or shortest in the sky. For us in the northern hemisphere, it's the longest day of the year. In December 21st, the sun is going to be at the most southern point. So in the south, that's the longest day of the year. And in the north, it's the shortest day of the year. And on March and September 21st, more or less, depends upon our, our uh, uh, leap years. So this year, the equinox was on the 19th. But this will be the halfway point. This is where we have roughly 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of night everywhere on the planet. In June 21st, that's the longest day of the year for us in Indiana. It seems like we have 24 hours of daylight. That's actually not correct. But we do have a very long day. December 21st, we have a very short day. But these two days, it's right in between, 12 and 12. How far north we are depends upon our latitude. How far east and west we are depends on our longitude. Now, these are a little bit tricky. Latitude is easy to calculate because you just start at the equator zero. Go up to the North Pole 90, go back down to the equator at zero, go to the South Pole it's 90, go back to the equator it's zero. These are all north and these are all south. So this is zero to 90 north, this is back to zero to 90 south, and back to zero. We have a North Pole and a South Pole. Very easy. We don't have an east and a west pole because we spin this way. So we have to pick a line and we have to call that where we start. We call that the prime meridian, the first meridian. A meridian line is something that goes from pole to pole through the equator. And we have them all over the place. That's part of how we define our time zones as well. The prime meridian is actually here in Greenwich. This is pronounced Greenwich in England because as the people were being trained in this portion right here, this is where England is, to go out in ships by the sea. They were all trained at this observatory and this naval academy in Greenwich. So they picked a place where all their sea captains were familiar. They all knew where this place was. And therefore, this became the prime meridian. This is where time zones begin. You may have heard of Greenwich Mean Time. That's where this is. The International Space Station, it goes around the planet 16 times a day. So what time zone does it have? It has Greenwich Mean Time because this is where time begins. Now, one of the ways in which we knew that the sky was not really going around us in a way that would make us a flat planet was by a very clever realization of a guy named Eratosthenes. And he was a librarian at the library in Alexandria, which was one of the wonders of the ancient world by almost any measure. And he figured out that at the longest day of the year, that June 21st day we've talked about before, in some parts of Egypt, the sun is directly overhead, so you don't get a shadow. But up where he was in Alexandria, you actually do get a shadow. And the reason why that would be different would be if it, if it was a flat planet, we would not in fact have a difference of shadows. The only way we have shadows that are different is if there is a curve here. And he actually hired someone to walk out this distance because if you know the distance in a triangle, if you know the distance and you know an angle, you can figure out the rest of the circle that's here. 
He was using basic geometry to figure out what was happening with this. He hired someone to pace this out. This was several hundred miles. There were no interstates and no sidewalks or anything there. Uh, so he was able to figure out what the difference is between the shadow here in Alexandria and the no shadow down here at Syene. This gave him this angle here because that corresponded to that angle up there. Again, it's pretty basic geometry. And he was able to figure out that the entire world was almost as large as it is today. He was within 95% of getting it right. So it was rather remarkable. I'm going to put up a video, again, from Carl Sagan's Cosmos series that I've mentioned before, where he talks about Eratosthenes and shows you a little bit more about this, because it's very clever. Now, in the ancient world, they had five planets plus the sun and the moon that would move through the sky. They didn't know about Uranus, they didn't know about Neptune, they didn't know about Pluto, they didn't know about anything that you needed telescopes to see. But they knew you could see the Sun, the Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those are five of the planets plus the Sun and the Moon, that's seven. Now we have seven days in our weekly calendar. That's not a mistake. We have a day of the moon, Monday. We'd have a day of the sun, Sunday. We have a day of Saturn, Saturday. We have a day for Jupiter, Woden's Day, Wednesday. We're using actually a different word there, but it's the same concept. We have Thor's Day, Thursday. Uh, we have Mardi Gras on a Tuesday, Mars. In some languages, they actually keep that there. So we are basing our calendar, even on a weekly basis, on the fact that we can see those with the naked eye. It took us until the 1700s and the 1800s to discover Uranus and Neptune and into the 1900s before we discovered Pluto. So our calendar might have been very different had we had more planets that we could see. But see, all of the stars seem to be right in the same spot every night. The Big Dipper is always where it is, Polaris is always where it is, Orion is always where it is. But Venus moves. Sometimes it's in the east and sometimes it's in the west. Jupiter moves. Sometimes it's in Libra. Sometimes it's in Aries. The moon moves. The sun moves. These are wandering things. And that's what planet means in Greek. They're wandering. So take this for example. If you were looking at Mars one night and a few nights later you were to look at Mars, you might notice, hey, these two stars here are still in the same spot. These two stars here are still in the same spot, but Mars has moved over. And then you go out a few nights later and Mars has moved over again. It's like, hey, what's going on here? Well, that's why they're wandering. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Venus, Mercury, the Sun, the Moon, they all move through the stars, but they all move along the ecliptic. Remember that line that we talked about where the constellations were, that were zodiac constellations? They all move on that line. But here is where it gets tricky. We get what's called retrograde motion. Sometimes, as we are going to watch Mars, it'll go, and then it'll stop, it'll go backwards, and then it'll go forwards again. That backwards motion is called retrograde motion. And it's not that Mars is actually going backwards. Because if you've ever watched a NASCAR race, or you've ever watched an IndyCar race, especially if you've ever seen the dash cam that they have, one of the things you might see off the sides is some of the cars seem to be going backwards. We know they're not going backwards, we just know the car that we're watching is going faster than they are, so they seem to be going backwards. What's happening here as we're going around the sun is we are lapping those planets. The further out you are, the slower you go. The further in towards the sun you are, the faster you go. So here we are at A, and we're watching Mars at A, so here it is. And at B, we've moved here and it's moved here. So there it is. But by the time we get to C, it hasn't moved very much, so it seems like it's gone backwards. And by the time we get to D, it still hasn't moved all that much, so it seems to be going backwards as well. By the time we get back to E over here, notice it's gone forwards again because we're now completing the loop. So the retrograde motion is not an actual backwards motion. It's just what we seem to be seeing because we're going faster than it is. 
that would create a problem in the ancient world. They were very good astronomers. They were able to figure out things before they could even figure out reading and writing. Here we have Stonehenge. That was set up before the people in ancient Britain could read or write, and yet they were able to arrange these stones in such a way that on the longest day of the year and the shortest day of the year and the equinox days of the year, they cast no shadows. That's not a mistake. This up here is probably a moon circle. You sit in the center of it, and over the course of a long period, probably 18.6 years, you're going to see the moon in different spots. Again, that's not a mistake. They were good at marking the sun, the stars, the seasons, because their livelihood depended upon it. Eventually, though, people would adapt into writing and pictograms. There's a cave in France that has moon phases dating back from nearly 13,000 years ago. But a lot of the ancient writing that we have tells us about seasons and about calendars because that was important for farming, knowing when to plant, knowing when to graze your crops or graze your animals and the crops that were growing and the grazing lands that would be growing, other kinds of things that would be useful for survival. And a lot of the ancient things that we have like this cuneiform script that we have here are actually farming and contracts. We don't have lots and lots of ancient literature in terms of uh, Beowulf and Gilgamesh and other kinds of religious texts, although we have some of those, certainly. But a lot of what we have are just basic day-to-day -day receipts and contracts. Now, eventually, as people figured out that these things happen on a pattern, we had the Greeks coming along and deciding to philosophize about stuff. And these are some names that you've probably heard of before. We have the first guy who ever became a named philosopher, and that's Thales of Miletus. And Thales was the first person to predict a solar eclipse. We don't have his writing, but we have other people who wrote about him and told us that he did that. That was remarkable because up until that time, people thought when there was an eclipse that it was probably something divine, that some, that some god was upset or something. Thales predicted that it would happen and it happened. Pythagoras came around not too long after and said, well, we can actually put numbers to these things. We can tell how long the cycles are. We can tell how long that things are going to happen, the speed with which things move. Plato then came along shortly thereafter and said, well, you know, math and numbers actually underpin a lot of things. We have chemistry and physics and mathematics and economics and all sorts of things that depend upon numbers now. Even the computer you're using has, a, has as its heart the numbers game. And then Aristotle came along and made things very sophisticated. But one of the things that they all agreed on that was actually not a bad observation but didn't take the observations far enough, was that the earth was in the middle. The earth was in the center. And as the earth was in the center, everything had to go around us. And that would create a problem because sometimes things seem to go backwards. So there was a guy named Ptolemy who put together a big book called the Almagest. And the Almagest basically just means the big book or the great book. And the Almagest plotted out where all of the planets would be on the backgrounds of the stars. And Ptolemy came up with this system to try to figure out how to explain the, the planets going backwards sometimes. And he put them together with epicycles. As a planet goes around the Earth, he said, it's also going around in a loop-de-loop. -loop. So as it would go around, it would go around sort of like this. And thus, we would sometimes see it going backwards and sometimes seeing it going forwards. But sometimes its backward time would seem faster or slower. Sometimes it seemed to be closer or further away. It would be a little bit brighter or a little bit dimmer. So he said, in fact, it's not going around the center of us. We're off center, and its epicycle center is a little bit off center. And that would make some of them longer and some of them shorter. It was actually a very clever idea. It makes no sense at all if we try to explain how it works. It doesn't work with physics. It doesn't work with what we understand, how things work gravitationally or dynamically. But it explains where things are in the sky. 
It made mathematical sense, and that was what was important to them. One of the things they never quite under, understood or, or figured out was why doesn't the sun do a loop-de-loop? -loop? Why doesn't the moon do a loop-de-loop? -loop? If they're going around us in the same way that Mercury and Venus and Mars and Jupiter and Saturn are, then why aren't they looping? And also the stars that are out there beyond the planets, why aren't they doing that either? So epicycles explained why some things are going backwards, but it wasn't a perfect solution but it was the best they could come up with at the time. This happened probably, if, you, if you're just sort of rough guesstimating where times are, around the time of Julius Caesar, around the time of Jesus Christ. It was a, just a little bit after that time. So it took nearly 1,500 years for another guy to come along, and his name was Copernicus. You see a picture of him here. And he put, up, uh, put out a big book, in challenge to Ptolemy's big book. And Copernicus's book was called In the Revolutions in the Heavens. He suggested that instead of having the earth in the middle with everything going around it, that in fact the sun be in the middle and everything goes around the sun. That gets rid of those pesky epicycles. We don't need to have that here. Now he published his book in 1543 noticed that he passed away in 1543. So he avoided, for the most part, being charged with being a heretic or anything like that, although some of his books were banned later on. But he came up with the idea that we now call the Copernican idea. He put the sun in the middle and everything goes around the sun, except the moon. He figured out that the moon was still going around us because of the shadows that were being cast on the moon from the sun as it goes around us. Now, one of the things he said that we could use to verify whether or not the planets were going around us or the sun would be phases, just like the moon. Here we see Venus as it's going around the sun. Where we're on Earth, sometimes we're going to see a crescent, sometimes we're going to see a half, sometimes we're going to see a gibbous. Can't really see full because it's going to be on the other side of the sun but we'll see these phases. Now, if Venus was going around us, we would not see these phases. But in 1543, we couldn't see Venus clearly enough because we didn't have telescopes. So we didn't know whether it had phases or not. We had to wait for Galileo to come along. Galileo came along, just notice the date here, just a little bit after Copernicus passed away, Galileo was born. And Galileo was a natural philosopher, which means he was interested in what happens and why, but he also wanted to experiment and figure out how we can verify what's going on. So he read about this wonderful device called a telescope and built his own based on what he read. He couldn't order it off of Amazon or eBay. He had to build his own. And here's the thing. If you have a pair of binoculars, 10 by 50 binoculars, 10 by 50 power binoculars, you have as good a telescope as Galileo started out with. So just imagine that. You can get this for $19.95. Uh, it doesn't cost very much at all. And you too can see the phases of Venus and you can see the moons of Jupiter. Galileo built his first telescope, we think in 1609, maybe 1608, uh, but, but uh, he read about it. This was originally being used for people to look for ships off the coast so that you could see ships that were coming in ahead of time. It was Galileo who really looked up first and saw the stars and kept looking. There were a couple of guys who, who said that they were before Galileo, but they didn't write anything down and they didn't continue their research. He continued his research. He looked at craters on the moon and saw that the moon was not perfect. It had lots of imperfections. That was a direct contradiction of Aristotle, who said that everything up in the sky were perfect. They were heavenly objects, and we still use that phrasing today sometimes, call them heavenly objects. He also looked at Venus, and when he looked at Venus, he could see the phases. That contradicted Ptolemy. That confirmed Copernicus. But here was the real thing. He looked at Jupiter and he noticed, and he kept this, this is his actual handwriting here, he kept this journal. 
and he noticed here are two dots and here's another dot, but notice down here two dots and the third dot over here. And then notice we have two dots and three or one over here and two dots and two dots. And we have these patterns emerging. Now there's a fourth dot in there that seems to do its own thing and that confused him for a little while. But he figured out that we've got this two and one and this two and one and this two and one and this two and one. Here's we've got this fourth one out there, but here's two and one again. And, and we have this pattern happening over and over and over again. Now Jupiter is one of those things that moves through the sky. So if these were things that were just moving behind Jupiter, then as Jupiter moved away, they'd still be over here doing their thing, but they moved with Jupiter. This was the first time that anyone ever saw anything going around something other than the Earth or other than the Sun. They were going around Jupiter, and we were looking at it edge on. We were looking at it on its side. And that's why sometimes they were in front of Jupiter, we didn't see them. Sometimes we were behind Jupiter, we didn't see them. But they moved around in a circle, and we're looking at them as they move back and forth. He called them Medicean stars because the Medici family was paying the bills. We now call them the Galilean moons or the Galilean satellites. Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. They're among the biggest moons in the solar system. Ganymede is in fact the biggest moon around the biggest planet in our solar system. So guess what happened? They called it a fake news tube. There were people who absolutely refused to look through the telescope because they said there are demons inside the tube designed to throw us off. Galileo was brought before the Inquisition and was told to shut the hell up, and he did, except he continued to write and smuggled his writings out. And we continue to honor Galileo for being right. He was working at the time of the Protestant Reformation, so the Catholic Church politically was under pressure at the time. Now, we sometimes use this story in an inappropriate way as an anti-Catholicism story, but the truth is, had Galileo been in Protestant areas in Germany, he might have been burned at the stake, because the Protestants weren't any happier at the idea of the earth not being the center of the universe than the Catholics were. So we have a tension between philosophy and religion and science that goes way, way back. It's not a permanent tension. And in fact, some of the people who have been good astronomers, good scientists, and people who have challenged the ideas of the world have themselves been religious figures. I myself am an ordained priest and a chaplain in a retirement community, so I know about this conflict as well. But sometimes it's not so much the religion, but the politics that get involved, and that's what was happening here. As Galileo's role model status persists to us today, we want to continue to think, stand up for your beliefs, no matter what. Now, Galileo continued his thought experiments and continued his actual experiments along the way. And one of the things he discovered was that Aristotle's old idea that big things fall faster, smaller things fall slower is incorrect. Try this at home sometime. Just take, take a piece of paper and take a book. And as you take a piece of paper and take a book, then We'll, we'll do a little bit of an experiment here. Drop both of them at the same time. Now pick them up again, crumple the piece of paper, crumple it into a ball, and now drop both of them again. You'll notice that the book is still several hundred sheets of paper and the one piece of paper is still the one piece of paper. But they now fall at the same rate. It wasn't that one was larger and one was smaller that was keeping the piece of paper from falling at the same rate. Their speed doesn't depend on the object itself. It depends on the earth down below. And that will become a very important part of our next ideas. So thanks for joining me today.